a life work. I mean, it's yeah. connected to learning work that's even more basic than this is. But right. But the uh, it's just a, it's just a it's a it's a civil criminal negligence that we let this go on. Right. And, uh, and we need a, a radical reframe. And, and I think the way to do that is to is to gather this kind of consensus because there's a there's a massive agreement at one level. But that consensus is not generally understood when you put those pieces together out in the general teaching community or parenting community. No, and I, you know, I've taught uh, technical writing for years, and I've taught um, business writing, and I've taught um, senior graduate students. I teach a course in how to write your dissertation, and so I see it at at the other end. Um, and I've also dealt with. Lots of uh, technical writing programs and ministers of technical writing programs, and one of the things that's curious to me is that there, there's a lot of pressure coming from industry on um, colleges like business and engineering to do more about communication skills, um, and yet uh, this is the one area where there's a great deal of resistance uh, among academics. Um, a lot of academic, particularly in uh, research universities, uh, in engineering fields and in technical fields and in the sciences, uh, see writing as being, the teaching of writing and communication skills as being the job of the English department or the speech communication department, and they see it as being completely separate uh, from professional um, uh, pr preparation. And so, uh, their students go out into business and industry and science, and they can't get from one end of the sentence to another because they've uh, not had any practice since freshman English. Um, and there, there are a number of movements. I'm sure you've talked to somebody about communication across the curriculum, which tries to put more writing and speaking back into the university classroom. Uh, and these have made some headway. And we, uh, this university has just hired somebody very good uh, working at that. But it's, it's an uphill fight because uh, the teaching of writing has been isolated in English departments, um, which by and large, uh, in terms of research, because of the historical development of English departments, have been charged uh, or have been rewarded, I should say, for publications on literature. And so the teaching of writing has been marginalized into freshman English. Um, and the rewards for uh, people like me uh, have been publishing in literary areas. Um, nowadays, feels like folklore and linguistics and film studies and things like that. But, uh, but by and large, uh, at most universities, the teaching of writing uh, ends at the very latest uh, in sophomore literature classes, and in many cases, particularly in the more technical fields, it ends with freshman English. So there's a gap. Um, and it sounds like there may be an aversion going on in these more technical uh, uh, subsequent areas to wanting to be responsible for assessing students in terms of their ability to communicate. Oh, absolutely. <laughs> Which is a way of saying I don't want to be held to that standard either for the professors. Oh no, <laughs> no, they 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 don't they, they don't want to do it, and and part of that I think is the fault of uh, specialization within the university, um, and and part of it is uh, a realization uh, on their part, which is quite accurate, that it takes time uh, from but to teach writing, uh, it takes. Uh, to to stop uh, what is supposedly the content of the film and say, okay, this is how an electrical engineer writes a report, um, takes away from what they see as their content. Um, and so the students, uh, you know, a student who hasn't had any writing from freshman year to the first year on the job is in for a, a big surprise in many cases because the kind of writing that they're asked to do is very different from what they're asked to do in, in, in the freshman class and certainly different from what they're expected to do in a course in, say, Survey of American Literature. Um, and also, I think uh, senior professors, particularly in in the uh, more prestigious universities, understand that uh, they're they're rewarded for um, research and for the amount of knowledge that they can give in in the uh, subject area, and that 
that any kind of time they take to teach writing uh, as as practice in that field uh, is, is time that takes away from what they're rewarded from. Um, and the changes in the last 10 years, I think, are significant, but they're still really not enough. Uh, we really have... Um, a lot of resistance to teaching communication skills in many, uh, many areas. Uh, surprisingly, um, to, to cite my own university, the, the college that has embraced teaching communication skills the most is the College of Agriculture, <laughs> um, because uh, they uh, have a, a very real sense of who their students are going to be dealing with very quickly. Um, and so uh, they're, uh, they've uh, placed a lot of emphasis on that in fields, um, some of them very traditional to deal with, with farming and agriculture, others like human ecology, where um, uh, they, they know exactly who their students are going to be talking to and writing to when they, and communicating with when, when they get out. Um, uh, of course, they have much smaller classes, uh, and so there's an economic... And they have a more stable industry, that I would imagine, creates a bit of a better uh, probabilistic assumption set about what the writing's life would be like. Right, yeah. Yeah. right. Uh, when you have uh, senior project courses in engineering, uh, which have 80 students, um, and you go to that professor and say, you need to do more with writing, uh, I can understand really why there's resistance. Or you go to the dean and say, or the department chair and say, uh, it would be nice to split this course in half uh, so that uh, we can do more with communication skills. Then uh, that becomes a very expensive operation. And uh, that so... Uh, it's it's taken it's taken a long time just to get where we are, so it's a it's a problem at the university level as as well at the lower level. Uh, I think the problem you're dealing with uh, mainly, if I understand you, you correctly, is that uh, there are a lot of people who will never get to college because of the way re reading and writing are taught at the lower levels. Yeah, um, and that, that that there's a a number of factors that need to be considered there. And that one of them, and one of the areas that we're really trying to focus on, is to help people understand how artificial, unnatural, technological this process is. Yes. And that um, it, <clears throat> at another level of our conversation with neuroscientists and psychological and developmental um, mm. people, it, what we're describing is, is a form of unnatural confusion yes. happening faster than thought. Yes. Right? That if a child doesn't get through it in a certain way, conditions them to have a certain uh, way of experiencing themselves, their minds. Yeah. It creates a certain shame aversion to certain kinds of thinking and processing, which really throttles their learning Yes, more generally and affects everything that happens to them. Right. And so it's kind of reframing our basic relationship with this code yes. that we're interested in. Which takes us, at one aspect, if you've watched or looked at some of the things, back to the very beginnings of writing and through the original development of the alphabet and the spread around the world of the alphabet and, and uh, its use by the Greeks and the Romans and yes. what it did to enable their civilizations and so forth. But also the, the difference between this original, more phonetic relationship where you're dealing with code cued, blended, Gatling gun like speech coming from, you know, scanning these letters to this uh, internal assembly required that comes along after the confusion of the writing systems of the Romans and the yes. spoken language of the English. And it's right at that period that um, tr talking with Richard Vineski, who was mm -hmm. kind of the nation's leading orthographist, um, who passed away, of course, last year, and um, he led me to Fisher. Yes. And Fisher led me to you. Yes. Right? Yeah. And so we kind of got full circle back <laughs> around to... What, what fascinated me in our first conversation and subsequently in looking over the resources that I could find on the web at that time and, mm -hmm. and a little bit since was that you seem to have, have paid uh, uh, parallel to Fisher uh, in, a, in a more rigorous sense in some ways uh, attention to how this developed in England and its effect on the middle class, on people yes. more generally. So yes. let, if we can, what I'm most interested in our conversation today is to go into that period of time as much as 
uh, we can about how the writing system formed that you're comfortable with. Yes. And then from there, how it how it kind of um, started to extend itself into the population and its effects on the population. Yes. Well, that's one of the things I've I've been looking at uh, uh, that since that work came out, which of course has been. Um, it's now 25, 25 years old. Uh, one of the um, interesting things that happened is that it, uh, the the idea of Chantry standard, uh, very quickly got into standard explanations and textbooks about how the language developed. Uh, and I think, in some ways, it it went in uh, more quickly than most theories, so that um, the, the usual process by which theories are tested and examined uh, was was bypassed. And uh, that upset a number of people who work uh, in the field because they uh, they had some qu some questions and qualifications that, that they wanted to make. And I do think the way that it has been explained in some cases uh, greatly oversimplifies what we were what we were trying to say. Um, that is, um, what we were what saying has been interpreted and in some cases uh, in in print as saying that you have an organization, the Chancery, which very consciously uh, set out to standardize uh, a written language um, and did so, and then more or less imposed this on on an unwilling group of of literate uh, readers. And I think um, uh, not only does that oversimplify what we were trying to say, but it it, um, it ignores other kinds of research that are being done in 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 the area. Um, you know that. To two main problems, I would say, um, if I can lecture for a minute, if you, uh, uh, just the idea of chancery standard. Uh, one is that uh, it was never actually standard. I don't think we ever implied that um, there, there was something called standard uh, chancery standard that was anything like um, a modern standard. Chancery, uh, what the chancery itself produced, was often very uh, different from from uh, one document to. Uh, to the other, um, and so uh, I, I think <laughs> calling a chantry standard in itself is is an overstatement, and I think we're uh, is is waving a uh, a red blanket in in front of a lot of uh, people who are only too willing to 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 charge at it. Uh, the the other um, problem I think, um, and I this is something I've been working on. Is the uh, the idea that the of the involvement of the chancery itself? I do think the chancery uh, staff was largely uh, heavily involved in creating this type of English that we've called chancery English, um, uh, and I've looked very carefully in the years after the publication of the anthology of Chancery English at the actual composition of the, of the Chancery staff. That was one thing we didn't know when we did the book. We knew who some of the senior uh, Chancery clerks were, but we didn't know who the people in the uh, lower ranks were. Um, and in the, in the subsequent years, I, I think I've come to understand better um, what at least could have happened, what's a plausible explanation uh, for this. And I think it really involves more than just the chancery staff that uh, I, I would call, uh, if I could go back and do it again uh, and take everything out of the textbooks that's in there, I would call it... Uh, Farringdon in English. Farringdon is a district of London in which the Chancery was located, but also uh, a number of other offices of the royal government, the Privy Seal, uh, the Signet Office, uh, and it was also uh, the legal quarter of London. It's what's the legal quarter uh, today. One of the things that I found was that um, there there is, I think, pretty convincing evidence that you have the lower ranking clerks of the chancery uh, living with law students and living with um, people who are training to be scribes and people who are training to, be, to, to uh, take up various writing professions uh, or professions that required writing uh, throughout the country who were living together in inns um, and the purpose of the inns was, was training. 
Um, and that the lower ranking chantry clerks particularly, who at that time, I, I think despite what has been thought, uh, a number of them were actually married, which was, which was a way of essentially killing yourself professionally. You could not go up in, in the ranks. But they were, um, these men with their wives were essentially running schools, boarding, boarding schools where people could come and learn, um, of various kinds. So, uh, I suppose one way to imagine it is to have a, uh, is it, as if you have a, a university, an, an elite, uh, university, um, rather old fashioned, uh, but very successful and very prestigious. And then nearby you have a law school and you have a lot of people who want to get into that law school or want to work in the paralegal profession. And the older university is not very much interested in helping these people, but they create uh, what we would call continuing education or uh, in Britain, intramural or extramural education, um, where you have a lot of people who are the equivalent of instructors or lecturers or uh, graduate students who are going out in the community and teaching these skills uh, to people who then will use them either to go on to in, into the legal profession, which has all of us been, especially in the 15th century, becoming uh, lucrative, um, or they're going off and they're becoming uh, stewards or they're becoming um, some uh, paralegals or they're becoming secretaries. But, they, but they've learned these these writing skills in this Farrington district of, of London. Um, and uh, and I think there's some research that's come out in the last two years that, that uh, supports that, that shows that uh, people in other parts of England write closer to this uh, chancery English uh, who are affiliated with, with, with the legal profession. And there's only one place where they could have, they could have learned that. So I, I think rather than saying... Uh, here are a group of bureaucrats, uh, senior bu bureaucrats who standardize English, and then off it goes. Uh, it, it's much more. It's much more complicated. Much than, more diffuse. Uh, much much more diffuse than that. Uh, much looser. Um, one uh, scholar said that the uh, that chancery chancery standard is Latin, and I, I think uh, certainly for the upper ranks of the chancery and most of what they produce, that's that's true. Um, but at the same time, there was something very important going on uh, where a very loose um, written dialect was created in this district of London, which I think is still the leading contender for being the most immediate ancestor of, of modern standard English. That's a long answer to okay, the question. Well, but and, and I appreciate the the caveats and the care with which you put this yeah. together. And I, I do. I mean, from from where we're coming from, what we're trying to do is to help the the person on the street, so to speak, the teacher right. or parent who hasn't given any thought to any of all of this, simply um, understand and whatever kind of safe generalizations we can make mm -hmm. that here there was a period of time at which. Um, uh, English English is used primarily by the church. A very small percentage of the population of England yeah. uses it at all. Right? It, it comes into uh, with uh, in the 700s. Uh, it, it gets uh, used for a while, and then it gets uh, uh, replaced during the uh, French, and then it it comes back to be to be on its route to us. Yes. And that during that period of time, there's a kind of um, uh, a density of official use, yes. a center of density of official use. Yes. That at the core of it is a king and some scribes, and then surrounding that and radiating outward are a series of other folks using it in different ways. But that this is the um, center of the shift that leads to where we are yes. today. Yeah. So now, I don't mean to put words in your mouth, but I'm looking for something that kind of uh, is comfortable as you can say it says something along those lines, to give people this meta view of the general emergence of English. Right. Well, I, I think uh, you had asked about Henry V and his role, and I noticed John Fisher uh, said, go see Richardson. Well, here I am. Right. Uh, and I, I would say um, that 
the description he gave and what you're talking about is uh, is accurate as, as I see it. You have in in the, up until about 1400. Um, of course, people are speaking English all over the place. Uh, you have uh, poets who are writing in English. Uh, you have poets like John Gower who are hedging his bets and writing in French, English, and Latin. Um, uh, but in terms of getting business done, the kind of thing that um, you would need to write, that the kinds of things that we all write every day, little memos, uh, business accounts, um, they really didn't have much prestige unless they were in Latin or, or French. Um, this is up to about 1400. Um, one of the curiosities in writing um, is... Uh, has been discovered by uh, a linguist in, in at Cambridge, Laura Wright, who's published uh, showing what she calls macaronic English, and it, what it shows is the the attempts of ordinary London uh, business people to keep their records in a language that they really don't understand. And so uh, you have a, a word that begins in one language and then it ends in another. Uh, these are the London bridge accounts. Um, they're, they're struggling. Uh, they're clearly struggling. Uh, another example would be uh, that's all through the records is uh, uh, how do you convert an English place name into Latin. Uh, you, you live in a town called Trumpington. Well, what's the correct Latin ending for that? And so the scribes, uh, in many cases, would simply uh, put a squiggle at the end, which says essentially, you make up your own ending to this one. I don't know, I don't know what it is. So th there were a lot of, uh, of practical needs, and, and as commerce developed over the 14th century, uh, I think it became pretty clear among the merchant class that they really needed to write in English. Um, Henry V uh, becomes uh, king in, in 1412. He um, immediately starts making plans for war. Um, he immediately needs money and needs the support, particularly of the merchant class of, of London, which is the wealthiest in the country. London is the port through which most of the trade comes. Um, it would be nice to have them and, of course, the members of parliament uh, who uh, on his side and and to be seen himself as, as an English uh, patriot, uh, because I, uh, I think I, I don't think Henry was a, uh, worried very much about linguistic matters, uh, but he was very concerned about uh, practical matters and about uh, getting money. And he was certainly smart enough to see that people uh, were uncomfortable with French. Uh, he uh, certainly was comfortable with French himself, um, but uh, he, he knew that there was this unrest. So after he becomes king, after he starts, uh, off on his wars to, uh, to France, he starts sending m many, if not most of his messages back, uh, his news, uh, to the London citizens in, in English. Um, he apparently asked his, um, his own staff, which was called the uh, the signet office, his private secretary, to start um, using English, or at least gave permission uh, to do so. Those were the letters that that I dealt with that were that were in 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 English. Uh, sometimes the replies that came back from the mayor and aldermen of London were in French. Uh, they apparently felt that. Uh, there's something fishy going on here, um, and that it uh, it would look better if they replied to the king uh, in French, even though he'd written to them uh, in in English. Uh, but there was an immediate reaction to that, and uh, we we can see this um, by the uh, well-known proclamation of the Brewers Guild in 1422, about the time uh, Henry died. And they simply said outright, since our king has started writing in English, we're now going to start keeping our own records 
in English, and and they did. <laughs> um, and you can see the shift uh, in the guild records uh, from that point on. Uh, now, the guilds had produced uh, not some documents in English, but almost all the guild records start shifting very heavily in into English. Uh, uh, it's never a clean process, um, both within and without the government. Uh, there's still lots of Latin and French, but English grows as the century goes on. Um, another thing that happens is that uh, people start writing uh, letters, uh, private letters and private accounts in English. Uh, and this is one of the things I've been looking at. Uh, the most famous example are the Paston letters. Uh, this huge body of letters, our greatest source um, of knowledge about what life was like uh, among at least this rank of the gentry um, that fill up two very thick volumes. Uh, they're on the web now. Um, an incomparable source of, uh, of knowledge about middle class, uh, well, upper upper middle class, lower gentry uh, life in, in, in England. Um, I don't think they would have been written uh, in the previous century um, because uh, they would probably, it would probably be expected that people of that class would be writing in French. Here they're, they're writing in English. But even beyond that, uh, we have letters from uh, ordinary merchants. We have a lot of letters from a family called Selly, um, who were um, not the best users of English, we'd say, uh, today, but they wrote lots and lots of letters in English. We really don't have anything comparable to that before 1400. Uh, another group I think were liberated by this um, uh, indirect encouragement of uh, the king uh, were women. We find many, many more letters, uh, private letters by by women, and uh, because women could uh, control their own letters. I, I, I don't think there's a lot of evidence that they would actually sit down and write them out in their own hand, um, but certainly the Paston family, the Stoner family, and many other women whose letters are found in the uh, National Archives from the 15th century um, uh, were able to at least supervise the writing of their letters, and they could pick them up and they could read them uh, much more uh, easily than if they were written in, in French. So, it, uh, this unintentionally, I think, uh, uh, Henry V uh, liberated people or gave uh, permission for people to use their own language in a way that uh, they were not able to do so before. Excellent, excellent. Um, yeah, thank you. That was very nice. My sense from my reading of people in this area, and obviously I'm, I'm on a really broad spectrum, right. so I can't go as, in, <laughs> anywhere near yeah. as deep as, as others can in each of the, of the nodes. But my sense was never that there was some official decree, this is the English, right. you guys go use it. You know, that there, there was yeah. this chain of command, uh, yeah. you know, radiating the, the way of doing things. But that um, there was this national identity with the language that started to shift. Yeah. That, like you were saying, there was a point at which the the right thing to do for a certain class that had the power and that would be engaged in literacy at all was to use Latin or French. Yes. And over a period of time, that switched to being to being English. Yes. Right. And uh, Fisher made the comment, I think, that um, in the 1400s or up to the 1500s, there were maybe like 5,000 people in all of England that could read and write right. in English. Right. And today, there's how many hundred million? Yes. So <laughs> there's, there, there's a point, a, a, a seminal point of, of change that's going on here. Yes. Whether we say it's somebody worked it all out and imposed it, or somebody just started to shift their behavior in a way that was influential, we're still talking about a turning point. Yeah, it is a turning point. I, I would describe it as a as kind of collective sigh of relief um, among especially the middle class in English, that, that, that they, they could use English. Um, now, you know, reading and writing were separate technologies uh, at the time. I'm sure you've talked to people about this before, that um, uh, writing, if, if, you, if you've seen pictures of, of how one went about writing in, in medieval England, it was, it was pretty hard. Um, you had to have special equipment. You, you had to have a, uh, not just an eraser, but several different kinds of, of, of scrapers. Uh, you had to be taught 
how how to write, which which most people weren't. So it it, it, would, it certainly uh, was common that people could um, could read very well, but had a great deal of difficulty writing much beyond their own name, particularly much uh, among the um, among the upper classes. Um, I think what um, and uh, consequently, it was it was simply the standard procedure, as it is in many developing countries today, like India, uh, that if you wanted to send a letter home, you would go dictate uh, the letter to someone, and then that person would put it in an acceptable rhetorical format. Um, and, and I think one of the main impetuses for uh, moving toward standardization uh, was that uh, this not only applied to private correspondence and business correspondence, it also applied to uh, official petitions and things that uh, that would get things done for you in the government. Um, official formatting. Official formatting, exactly. So uh, that if you were living in the north of England uh, and you were going to send a petition to Parliament, uh, you would want that cast in what seemed like the most prestigious kind of English uh, possible. So, in, 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 implicit in that, that that how well your request is received is connected to how well it's formatted. To yes, be. absolutely. <laughs> okay, that's absolutely. So, so, you're describing something. It's almost like a precursor to telegraph use, in that, that you take yes. your message to somebody and they go, they have to put it into a particular code, a particular format, yeah. so that it'll get across. The other person can read it and unfold it for you. Exactly, exactly. And uh, now, again, I, I'm not saying this is a lockstep process. Uh, there are plenty of petitions out there. There are plenty of things that find their way into the official records that are still highly dialectical or that show a blend of things that we can say. Oh, Ha! This is like the chancery, but then the next word, uh, the next word isn't. Uh, in the next few years, we should be able to know a great deal more about this because uh, the, the, the petitions that were sent in to the central government are now being digitized. Um, and I, I just come from a conference, and uh, I was told that about a third of the eighteen thousand petitions are, are now digitized. But uh, we we should be able to uh, use our, our these wonderful uh, skills that we have now with the computer to be able to to tell just uh, the the pace at which things became more standardized. But right now it's um, it, it seems seems pretty clear that uh, people caught on very quickly that highly dialectical uh, petitions um, and other official correspondence with the government were uh, suspect. Um, and this is where this training in this Farrington district of London comes in because uh, – I think one or two things happened or both were happening at the same time that if you were in Yorkshire and wanted to send a petition to Parliament, you would seek out somebody who'd been trained in this area of London and who could approximate uh, not just the rhetorical format, but the linguistic format. Or it's possible that you would have, uh, let's say, an attorney, someone with power of attorney who was actually in London, who could either do it himself or go to one of these uh, places and, and have it done. It's even possible that, um, and, and there's some suggestion in the records that this was happening, that um, that a, uh, what we would call a student in in this continuing ed program uh, would be willing as part of his training to write one of these things out for you. Um, may, uh, one hopes supervised by, by 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 somebody. But if if you wanted to to have an official document done, uh, this this person could do it for you as part of his training. This sounds very much like the like the scribal tradition throughout literacy of, yeah. of needing specialists to translate across the page. Yeah, uh, I, I I think so. Um, I mean, we 
We're still negotiating the computer, for example, um, and the the computer gap the, the, uh, in, in the school system, uh, the haves and the have-nots, uh, the people who have access to computers, the people who understand what they can do with it, the people who can write on computers, and, and the people who can't. Something probably everyone familiar with, and it's an area where there's still a lot of negotiation, is email. Uh, what's acceptable on email and what's not. Um, and, uh, you know, every day we read about somebody getting nailed by the law for sending some injudicious email, which then gets sent uh, to, to thousands of unsuspecting uh, readers. But uh, on another level, uh, you probably have people who send you emails uh, with no capitalization, and they say, this is a new form. Uh, it's okay. You can just blast it out. No capitalization, no punctuation. Just just the purpose of email is to get a message out. And then you have other people who are greatly offended by something like that and go through and very carefully edit their emails. Um, and, and it's inversely related to the, the volume issue, right? I mean, that the, the, oh. the more that people do it, the more that... I have, had, I have an email correspondence. My favorite uh, example of all this is with... Uh, uh, James Heckman, who's the yeah. Nobel Prize economist mm -hmm. in Chicago, yeah, and uh, and he will send um, fragments of words, in <laughs> fragments of sentences that are are almost a, a cryptic code. Yeah, and some people, like you say, they'll 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 embellish. So it's elaborate. It's nuanced. And for yes. other people, it's just as brief and informal as will get the gist of that message across the pipe. Yes. Uh, or you see people uh, who who change over time. Um, we had an administrator here who was um, a, uh, a Henry James scholar. Uh, and if you've read Henry James novels, you know they're voluminous. Uh, and he, uh, in the 1980s, uh, when he first started sending email, his emails would be two and three pages. Um, as he became more successful and moved up the administrative ladder and is now president of a university system, his his emails uh, became quite concise as as he went through that process. So, uh, but we're we're still negotiating uh, that form of communication. Um, and it, there is a divide, and that brings back to what you were saying earlier, which I thought was really fascinating. That there was a language divide as well as a literacy divide. Yes. There was a there was an upper crust of the population that was hanging on to its its. Uh, aristocracy in a way by virtue of its connection to these languages which were less common in the population in yes. French and Latin. And there's the common people speaking English, but um, uh, the differences in their proficiency with language being being part of the social stratification system. Yes, absolutely. Yeah? yeah. And then, then you overlay on top of that literacy. Yes. And one of the things we will probably never know about is the amount of bilingualism in in the lower classes, that is, the classes beneath uh, the aristocracy. Um, how, because you know, clearly, a London merchant who has to deal with a, a French-speaking aristocracy and whose um, trading partners are uh, in France and the Low Countries, uh, would pick up enough uh, practical French to be able to to speak to these folks. Uh, the same thing with uh, a member of the gentry or the aristocracy um, who has to deal with uh, servants who don't speak French or speak speak very little French. Um, it's very difficult to to measure the amount of of oral bilingualism that was that was going on at that time. Uh, Talk about the, the, the spread of literacy. I mean, at one point you made the statement that, you know, that a lot of people were reading, but only a few people were writing. Yes. Right? Um, but there wasn't a lot prior, now this is prior to the printing press, and this is prior yes. to the ascendancy of, of the slow ascendancy of English yeah. as the writing system. So when we say a lot of people were reading, I mean, we really don't mean a lot of people, we mean... Um, right, <laughs> right. Uh, How many people were reading anything in England? Uh, what percentage of the population in the 1400s? Any idea? Oh, that's a very, very contested area. I mean, pro certainly not more than about 3%. Um, 
But then how do you define uh, literacy? And I'm sure you've dealt a lot with that. I mean, that's a question uh, even, even today. Uh, I think many uh, medievalists now would say that um, you know, someone who could read a little bit, or even uh, we, there are even scholars who say, if you can listen to and comprehend a text being written to you, then that gives you um, literacy in in medieval terms because they just didn't think of it in in the same way that uh, we do. One one of the things I was noticing, looking through uh, chronicles recently, is uh, the amount of material that was posted around London. Uh, now, some of this was read out, as uh, familiar from film, someone standing up and reading a proclamation, and everyone goes, oh my. But then these were, uh, these, these were subsequently posted all over the place. And, um, you know, f f at the very least, it gives writing a kind of uh, aura, but uh, also I find it difficult to believe that, that people weren't coming along and reading these or reading them to other people, that there, there, weren't, there weren't people who could... Uh, who could uh, were were able to read and and read to other people? Um, they had different attitudes about uh, private letters, for example. Private letters, what we consider private letters, were were always meant to be uh, read aloud, like uh, poetry. Uh, it was just that was expected to be read aloud. And we have a portrait of of Chaucer uh, reading Troilus and Cressida to uh, the court of Richard II. Um, but that was. Uh, uh, that was the way people uh, ex expected um, written documents to be communicated. There's uh, there were prompts for speech. There were prompts for speech, and and there's a famous story of a king who uh, was able to read, uh, and he would read documents, but he would also have them read to him, uh, so he would get the full communication. Um, so there were many gradients of literacy in, in the Middle Ages that are, are difficult for, for people who associate reading and writing today. Reading and writing are inextricably gathered together, but that, that, that wasn't always true, and I don't think it's true in a lot of developing countries today. We go back to that, uh, that question on a, a somewhat different angle. I we can't apply today's ideas of literacy yeah. right, to what was going on at that time. But the, you mentioned before, maybe you could, because uh, you, you came quick on my question, yeah. um, the, uh, that about 3% of the population of England were uh, literate in the sense that they, um, maybe you could use some benchmark. They, they, they could read a, uh, you know, a proclamation or they could yes. read, uh, you know, a, a a letter that was sent to them without having somebody else read it for them. Yes. Now, the other distinction you made was is that some people were considered literate if they could understand language that was structured for writing. Yes. Right. That's an important distinction. Yes. That's, because that what they're what you're describing is, is that there's a separation between oral exchange and the formatting of language that comes with writing, which is the first stage of literacy. Yes. Maybe you could expand on that and connect it with the percentage of the population in some way. Then we can move from there into how it changed to involve more people over time. Well, you, you can probably uh, gather that I'm very nervous about giving, <laughs> giving percentages because uh, well, whatever with you that, can, the, with what, what I'm trying to do grade. is give people a sense that, you know, we haven't all been reading for that long. No, we, we haven't. And, and I mean, one thing I think that's tied into it is that people learn, people learn to read and then they learn to write because they need to, uh, because there's a need that's there. Um, and it's, it's a common uh, joke in undergraduate teaching to talk about illiterate knights. Uh, this, is, this is one of the big jokes. In the, they were knights, they were in the nobility, and they couldn't read. But actually, what a knight had to know was very complicated. Um, if, if you actually look at the body of knowledge a knight had to possess, or should possess, I should say, um, and reading was just simply not one of them. There wasn't a need to learn to, to, to read uh, for, for a number of reasons. And the th same thing was true of, of merchants, that um, they were able to get along through using various means. Even the central government used um, tally sticks 
uh, to measure taxes. Uh, tally sticks, I don't know if you've seen pictures of them or not, but they were just notched sticks that were sent in to uh, show how much uh, taxes were raised. And these were used by the, the Royal Exchequer, which um, uh, then entered, did enter it in writing, but they, they preserved the uh, tally sticks as well as, as a check. And one of the amusing points of history, although it wasn't amusing at the time, is that, um, you know, Parliament um, uh, decided to get rid of the tally sticks, the medieval tally sticks, in uh, the early 1830s, and they built this big fire and threw them in, and uh, the Houses of Parliament got caught on fire and burned down. <laughs> so the you might you might uh, consider Mexico. that the yeah yeah the the the, the revenge of illiteracy uh, on on a, on a new age, but. Um, uh, I, I, the, you know, the, the percentage, you know, the percentage, percentage was always very small, but people, um, I, I think as the, the capability to, uh, to write, uh, uh the, the, the capability that, that they could put their words in writing and they, that, that they could get the message they intended across, uh, became, uh, more of a reality as English became more accepted, the vernacular became more accepted in the 15th century. Um, the number of people who could be considered literate in the sense that they could dictate a message and possibly even read it uh, grew. But, you know, given these gradients, uh, I'm, I'm a little scared of, of giving uh, a percentage because it's almost impossible to, uh, to, to measure that. There, there's uh, a book by M.T. Clanchy, From Memory to Written Record, that deals, it actually deals with the period before 1300, where um, he measures the growth of writing uh, and the dependence of the government on writing by things like uh, the amount of um, parchment that the government bought, uh, and the amount of wax that it bought to to seal things, and uh, the, watching the curve of the use of and, the materials what, that go into it, right, and and what people uh, what people said uh, in in court, and it's very ingenious and probably the closest uh, we're we're going to get. But give, given all these uh, uh, different con concepts of liter literacy, it's it's very hard to say. I mean, the the the, the number of people who can actually sit down and read and write. Uh, with a great deal of fluency it may have been one percent, uh, but it's um, uh, you know given the different gradients of uh, of what can could be considered literacy, it probably swells uh, somewhat. But it's it, it's not a, a lot of people. On the other hand, um, the uh, respect for writing the. Uh, Growth in the trust in writing, which uh, Clancy shows uh, growing uh, from 1100 to the period we're talking about, is really quite remarkable. Uh, there are records, for example, of peasants who had seals, <laughs> um, which is is really the beginning of of the. Uh, knowledge that written records um, are are important, and also um, the the shift that he traces uh, in uh, um, the trust of the written word over the spoken word. That is, in 1100, um, it's pretty clear that if a person comes to court and says, "I." I saw Bob buy this cow on the 4th of June when there was a big rain. That was good. 1400, this uh, same person would have to have a written document to, uh, to prove that. And, uh, you know, the, the, of course, we still have dependence on, on oral it's testimony. It's literally it true. It's literally, yeah, <laughs> it, it, it didn't go away. But um, by, uh, 1400 uh, or 1300, as, as Clancy shows, the written document trumped the spoken document by, uh, by, by quite a margin, even though forgery was rampant. <laughs> and that was, that's another byproduct of, uh, of There was this literature. myth that developed, if it's in writing, it must be true. Yes. It's in yeah. a way that was... No, a well, myth, clearly just a myth. I mean, <laughs> sure. Uh, some of the worst forgers were uh, uh, 
religious houses uh, because uh, uh, they were, uh, of course, from, from their background and training, uh, they knew the value of the written word. And so they uh, had no qualms at all uh, about, uh, the, since they were the first uh, professional group, we might say, to actually keep their records and keep them bound in codex volumes, um, they were the first group to simply forge deeds. And uh, this was another reason that the government started keeping records, because they'd come up with a charter and they'd say, look, all this belongs to us. Here's a charter from from Henry the First, and the government would go back and look around and say, well, we really don't have anything to uh, confirm that or deny it, but they have a charter that seems to be real, so uh, maybe we'd better start keeping some records too, and, and they did, um, which is one of the reasons why the English uh, public records are the most extensive in, in Europe. <laughs> the great story. Yes, I'm always amazed at. I mean, democracy. Everything seems to emerge from the conflict between the polarities, right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> so, oh, sorry. sorry, I had a beeping on the microphone. Okay. Oh, sorry. Um, no, that was great. That was great. Yeah. So, <clears throat> I appreciate um, you bravely going into these areas that <laughs> make you a little bit nervous. Yeah. Remember, what we're trying to do is we're not trying to be scholarly accurate. We're, right. we're trying to get people an impression that a lot of people think that reading's a natural thing. Yes. Right. Right. And when we look at the the uh, length of human evolution, and we look at the time that human beings have struggled to learn to use this technology, I mean, yeah. it's a it's a blip on a whisker. Yeah. You know, I mean, it's just right now. It's fresh. Yeah. And it's this transition here that we're talking about mm -hmm. that sets the stage up for where we are today. Yes, uh, it's it's really a nodal point um, in the lives of ordinary people, at least ordinary middle class people, uh, where reading and writing become essential skills. Uh, and I think that's what you're, you're looking at. Uh, there's a long period where it's not really important. Uh, the period that I'm looking at, I would say, is a period in which for the merchant class, anyway, um, it's a des highly desirable quality and it becomes highly desirable as it goes along. Then later, it becomes essential. Uh, it becomes a point where you can't enter the middle class uh, without having those skills. And today, um, we're in a much more democratic society uh, where we believe um, that everyone ought to have the uh, capability, ought to have the opportunity to move up economically. Um, and that, for, because for a long time, I think uh, we were willing to accept uh, that lots of people would just never have those skills and they were going to stay where they are, they were going to stay laborers. or And so the minimal amount of being able to sign your name would, would, would be fine. But now we're, we're launched on a new experiment where uh, we would like everyone to have the opportunity to, uh, to, to move up. And this is, this is different. This, this is different, and I think what you're looking at are the, the blocks to this, things that are left over from a previous age that were, um, uh, that were created for a class system that, uh, th that doesn't exist uh, anymore or, uh, or shouldn't exist anymore. Yeah, uh, thank you. I think that's better said. Yeah, that, yeah. That, there's, a, there's a remnant to these ancient, ancient, <laughs> relatively recent but still ancient structures that have unfolded through time that, I mean, it's not a difference in the uh, natural intelligence latent in the, in the difference in children right. here. You know? I mean, right. it, it's, a, it's the um, institutional inertia. Absolutely. And the whole ways of teaching that it would work with... A, a relatively small percentage of the population don't work with 
the kind of population we have now. I'm sure you've been told this many times. I mean, we have a population of, of people who are trying to move up on the social ladder from poverty into the middle class. Uh, we have huge numbers of immigrants coming into this country um, who are often taught English taught reading and writing uh, with a model that might have been suitable in the 1830s uh, when you have a relatively few number of people, most of whom uh, were already being taught a foreign language, usually French or Latin, just like 200 years before. Um, and so they could understand uh, things like declensions in, in a way that are meaningless to uh, a lot of people in this in this country right now. Um, we, on, on the on the higher end of education, uh, where where I am supposedly, um, uh, I still see uh, obsessions with standard spelling and standard punctuation. Uh, not so much in uh, the humanities, but in in other fields uh, where. We, I mean, mean, meaning people who teach English, have taught from grade school up that the measure of good English is standard spelling, standard spelling and punctuation. Um, and w one of the sad things for me is uh, when I go out into industry and do consulting is that uh, managers who, who are completely flummoxed by the inability of their new college graduate employees to be able to write a report uh, is that the managers don't have the vocabulary to, to explain to me what the problem is. They will say, spelling, they can't spell. You have to go in there and do something about spelling and punctuation. It's just terrible. The reports are unreadable. Well, I go in and I look at the reports and the problem isn't spelling. I mean, it may be true that they don't they don't spell that well, or, or grammar necessarily, although there may be grammar problems, is that they can't organize. They have no conception of what the expectations, rhetorical expectations of that profession are. But the manager can't explain that to me because he or she has been gone through our school system and been punished for misspellings and grammatical errors. Um, and, and so has, has equated that that, that, that kind of really artificial standardization with, with good English, with, with communication. With it, yes. And, and this trickles back to the developing child with intelligence, with, their, yes. with the quality of their being. Yes. That because they can't uh, intuit uh, the, uh, uh, the ability to conform to an artificial standard, yes. conven series of conventions, which are... Um, <laughs> Bizarre. <laughs> yes. Right? And, and, and just, then, then there's something fundamentally wrong with them. Yeah. Yeah. There are historical accidents um, that have, have become uh, ingrained or aspects of them have become ingrained in our consciousness as being the equivalent of good communication when there are lots of other things that we should be looking at. Um, I think part of this Part of the problem is uh, the decline of rhetorical education in in the school. That is, um, and I'm not advocating everyone should go back and uh, try to speak like Cicero, as in the 19, 19, early 19th century uh, education. Uh, but what rhetorical training did give was a sense of audience, a sense of of appropriate speech. Uh, Depending on the people you're you're dealing with, with um, uh, rhetoric is, uh, I would say, pr pretty liberal uh, in in that respect. And the the separation in teaching of rhetoric and writing, even though most of our universities have a division called rhetoric and composition, it's really composition. Um, and I think also in education colleges uh, that. At least the ones I'm familiar with require a course called uh, from the English department called Modern English Grammar, uh, but they don't require courses in in rhetoric. So, what you mean by this? Communication skills uh, is, is very problematic still, and and we see this um, 
it, it, every day. It's exacerbated by uh, the huge number of immigrants we have in the school system uh, with students who come in to the public schools who who can't speak English or have just a rudimentary uh, sense of English. And, uh, you know, one of, one of my hopes is that this will precipitate a crisis where we look at the entire picture and, and, and see what we're doing and see that the kind of education that we got in the 1950s uh, is, is just not working anymore. It's, again, it's, it's perpetuating a modern equivalent of the language literacy divide we were talking about before. Yes, it, it, it is. And we're eliminating many people. Uh, just, just to give you uh, one example, and this is, uh, I realize it's the people who have already made it through the system, but I had a, a graduate student who did a thesis uh, some years ago where she uh, talked to engineering professors about writing and about how writing should be taught to engineering students on the undergraduate and the graduate level. And their opinion was almost universally that they had nothing to do with that, that this was the problem of the English department until uh, you get to the dissertation stage, writing a doctoral dissertation. And then there were all kind. whoops, there were all kinds of, uh, uh, not surprising, uh, then there were all kinds of uh, pious comments about uh, mentoring and how the dissertation pr professor should be there all times helping with the writing and the shaping of the dissertation. And, and that's all very good. The problem is that the people who don't come into the system already having some concept of the organization, uh, uh, mental processes that go into writing an argument in the traditional academic way, that those people aren't there that they'll never make it to the uh, dissertation. Which comes back to how do you create the environment that's causing the need for them to do that in incrementally, unfoldingly more complex ways along the whole course rather than yes. this being some uh, you know obstacle course wall at the end of the game. Right, and, it, and that's, that's a, an accurate term, uh, an obstacle course, uh, because it means that people are eliminated who haven't been trained in their early education to think and write this way. Um, I think it's uh, one of the reasons that um, you, uh, well, one of the many reasons that you see comparatively few women uh, getting through in, in science and engineering education, uh, much better than it was, but, but still, not, still not great. And certainly people from lower socioeconomic uh, classes are, are just not making it through, except of course, the ones, you know, the talented 10th, you might say, um, and many of the others give up uh, because they, they just don't have that kind of basic so That's structure. one of our key points. Not only do they give up, they've, they've, they've come to learn something about themselves, which isn't necessarily true, but that it's hard not to believe, which is that they are somehow fundamentally deficient, yes. unable. Yes. And that's a heck of a wound, scar, image. Um, and aversion to learning to carry around in life. Yes. Well, you've probably talked to uh, returning students, what are called returning students, which usually means older students, students who've dropped out at some point and, and come back. Um, uh, and we don't get that many uh, here because uh, they don't feel welcome and a lot of a lot of them come in through evening school, uh, but now they're being put into the community college system, uh, which is a great receiver of, of returning students. And I think that's that's a wonderful thing. But one of one of the things I've found in um, teaching the returning students who come uh, who come my way and have not been uh, huge numbers that um, they are petrified of writing. They are petrified of writing. Now, in fact, once we get them going because of their life experience, uh, they do fine. But when they come in, they see uh, writing as this tremendous obstacle because of grammar, because of prescriptive grammar that they've been taught and spelling. Um, and this is the first thing uh, they'll tell me. M most of them are not shy. They're older and they come back and they say, I'm, I'm terrified of this course. My grammar and writing are, are are just not good. Most of them get through fine uh, w w without 
without any kind they of problems because they overcome the fear of being confused. They they do, and and they realize, well, I can understand this. It's it's really not that hard. Um, but I was traumatized when when I was young. Yeah, yeah. it's like the like the story. I don't know if it's true or not, but the, it always comes to mind is the the myth of the way they train uh, elephants in India with a little rope. You know, yeah, <laughs> they grow up thinking that they can't get free of that rope, and we've got you know. <laughs> A hundred million people or so in this country that think there's something wrong with them and they can't learn because the, of the emotional response that they yeah. had to a confusion that wasn't their fault. Right. Yeah. They got a paperback that's full of red marks and uh, they, they, this is hopeless. Or the comments, uh, or, or they have to go diagram a sentence on the board when they're in the fourth grade. and. You know, their parents don't even speak English, and uh, they, their English is a little touch and go, and, and they can't get through. Yeah, they give up. They give up. Uh, Let's step back to something you said, which is a real hot button for us, which was the historical accidents. Yes. Take us on a tour, as best you're able to, yeah. of what you think are the highlights of historical accidents associated with the, the development and evolution of our writing system. Oh, uh, the, uh, well, one historical accident we've been, well, an obvious historical accident is the way England kept getting invading, kept getting invaded by different kinds of people and the way the language uh, developed that way. And I know you talked to John Fisher about that and how English is a conflation of uh, several different languages, certainly uh, Anglo-Saxon and French and Latin and Scandinavian languages and a little bit of this and a little bit of that in the last century, uh, even more um, coming in. Those certainly have nothing to do with central planning of, of language. Um, I, one I, I know you're, you're interested in is the accident of, of the printing press, uh, which in England, uh, served to free spelling uh, in in the 15th century, so that you have these uh, bizarre uh, uh, spellings which are baffling to foreigners. Uh, the, the one uh, of the ob obvious example, uh, the O U G H T, um, which would not have been a problem to anyone in the 15th century who could who could read. They would have said, well, there's throck and there's talk, and uh, that's the way they're pronounced. But now we have uh, through and all of these other variations of that, which are just utterly senseless. Um, and to me, uh, that is a great accident. Um, another accident that um, actually comes out of education, I, I don't know if this could be... Um, uh, considered an accident or not, was, was the long predominance of Latin uh, as a prestige language, long after it ceased to be spoken, long after it served any kind of use whatsoever in, in Northern Europe. Uh, it preserved attitudes about language that were then codified by prescriptive grammarians in the 18th century that, that we're still stuck with, uh, paradigms of teaching English um, that are based on Latin grammar that are utterly senseless. And w one example I think everyone can understand is the split infinitive. Um, I, I still find uh, particularly people who are in the humanities, not necessarily in English, who become uh, enraged over a split infinitive. This is a rule that comes out of the 18th century. Um, you know, you can't say to boldly go where no man has gone before. That's a split infinitive. That's a terrible thing. Well, this is an utterly senseless rule that comes from Latin, because in Latin, you can't split an infinitive. <laughs> an infinitive is one word. In English, it's two words, to write, to run. So, why can't you put an adverb in the middle? Why can't you say to boldly go? Well, because somebody back in the 18th century said Latin is the most prestigious language. You can't split an infinitive in Latin, so therefore you shouldn't be able to split an infinitive in English. Uh, that to me is, um, uh, and, and the kind of prescriptivist tradition like that, that came out of the 18th century um, and, and earlier is one of the more unfortunate historical accidents that we're, that, uh, we're stuck with. 
Um, so I don't know. Those are two. Those are, good. Those are great. Those are great. Uh, Go back to the printing press for a moment and give us a more exploded view of that. I mean, um, I've heard some people address the uh, um, the cost of fonts. <laughs> I mean, there's many different dimensions in which the, um, the some have said something about the printing press just coming at the wrong time in the evolutionary process <laughs> of written English. So. Um, and that's what that's part of what we're trying to convey. I mean, we're talking about yeah. this 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 soup of languages that hadn't quite <laughs> gelled at the time it, it gets frozen or snapped in by subsequent things. Which the, the the printing press technicians were no more conscious of the hundreds of millions of struggling learners that would follow them than the no no they were just trying to. Uh print and make some money. Uh, some of them had some other ide ideals, but, you know, there were, I mean, another rather small example of an accident is the loss of letters, uh, several letters that were lost out of the English language that represented actual sounds. And they were lost simply because the printers um, came from the Low Countries, and the the the, uh, the actual um, typeface came from the Low Countries, where they didn't have those letters, or they had lost them centuries before. And so, uh, an example I think that'll be familiar to most people is uh, you'll be driving along in uh, through a shopping district, and there'll be a cute little shop that says "Ye Old Tea Shoppy." Uh, well. The Y um, in Old English would have been a, a letter called thorn, um, which was being used up in the 15th century. And uh, when they started printing, uh, the Dutch didn't have a thorn. Uh, so they used something that looked like a thorn, which was a Y. And so no one ever, ever said ye old tea shoppy. They always said the old tea shoppy. Uh, an, an, an accident of print. Yeah, it would have, it probably would have been better coming at another time, but we don't get any, we don't get any choices in, in those matters. Um, uh, it would have been better once, uh, say, if if a, a relatively standardized form of English had been agreed on, maybe so. But we don't get to make we don't get to make those choices. We just do the best uh, we we can. And certainly, um, other languages have fared much worse <laughs> than uh, than English by being subjected to uh, the Latin alphabet and the sounds that missionaries and other well-intentioned people um, heard and translated into the Latin alphabet um, languages of Native Americans, for example, uh, which contain all kinds of sounds that can in no way be represented by the, uh, by the Latin alphabet, um, and then found their way into print, and then they're, they're stuck with it. Uh, Irish, another example. Uh, the uh, absolutely baffling, baffling spelling of the Irish language, which um, uh, the, the, the Irish have tried to undo in this century, uh, undo the work of uh, a thousand years before, uh, where you have monks coming in from Italy and, and saying, what on earth are these people saying, and trying to reproduce the, uh, the sounds of the Celtic language that was being used using the Latin letters, and they were stuck with that. Uh, until uh, the early 20th century when they try to uh, simplify it. Well, that uh, the fact that almost nobody spoke Irish, only something like 5% of the population uh, helped. But I'm, I'm sure you've looked into uh, efforts to simplify English spelling. And, uh, I have, and I've heard, I've heard we get, uh, we get <laughs> frequently contacted by people with that agenda. Yes, and it would be nice. It would be nice, but you see what's happened. I mean, there's this tremendous force of uh, of, of inertia. So, I, I think we're stuck with English orthography as it is for the foreseeable future. Um, so the question is, how do we make? How, how do we do a better job of teaching that? How how, how do we reach all of these new, how, all, not 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 just children, but but uh, immigrants and people who. Um, really should be given access to uh, the demands of 21st century civilization. Uh, and one of the demands is literacy in the modern sense, reading and writing fluently, good communication skills. Um, and I wish I could tell you, 
I wish I could tell you, but... We're, we're, you know, thank you. We're not so much looking for the magic bullet, as, yeah. you know, uh, as the magic glasses. I mean, we, we need to see yeah. this differently, is our sense. And yeah. the, the, the closer we get to the kind of reframe in understanding that it's not the kid's fault, it's not the parent's fault, it's not the right. teacher's fault. We're all dealing with the, the transmission of a certain uh, ignorance and, and negligence and accident that's been propelling itself through history. Yes. And, and um, we need to, to understand that and build new kinds of bridges, new training will effects, new ways to get people up into this that aren't locked into the uh, steeped protectionism of days of old because the conventions themselves are arbitrary. Yes. Um, they're extremely arbitrary and there, there are so many people who are vested in the current system. I mean, people of goodwill who are vested in, in the current system found in English departments, in education departments, in colleges, I think especially, um, and um, many other places in, in our society. I mean, what we've created is a way in which uh, many people in in power, and it doesn't have to be very high up the food chain, um, are able to, uh, to uh, eliminate people uh, from consideration uh, for advancement, uh, are able to literally write them off because they say, uh, this person doesn't have good communication skills. This person is going is going to have to stay as a mid-level manager for the rest of the time because of these communication skills. Um, and w whether or not we like to admit it, a lot of times these are the very people they want to get rid of, they want to eliminate because they're of the wrong class or the wrong ethnic group or something like that. They have an excuse, and they don't even have to be consciously uh, aware of that. Yes, that it's that more convenient doing. to not be. It's exactly. <laughs> exactly. Yeah, and uh, I mean, this is <clears throat> the people that need the most help aren't on the radar screen of the people in power in the sense that um, not being um, sufficiently literate, not able to participate. They don't have the economic means, and they don't have a collective voice in the same way as the other constituency groups. And so um, this, the whole machinery of literacy and all the learning that goes with mm -hmm. it and what it enables um, is, a hu is this huge divide we've been talking about. Yeah. And the people that are on the other side of it aren't really well represented because they don't have any economic meaning. They don't have any economic meaning, and they don't. Most of them don't understand wh what the value of this is. I mean, they've been they've gone to school. They've been told they're not good enough, and they've decided they just don't need it. So, if you could identify a group of people and get in, get in a room and say what what you need is is literacy, they would probably say we've tried that, and that doesn't work. We we want we want something else. So it, it also may be a question of explaining it to the people who need it in a different way, um, and and in a non-threatening way. Where I they think I that's really a key. That what we're what we're, tr we're really trying to do is to help reframe the experience they've had to free them from the shame prison yeah. they're in about it. Right. Right. They don't need somebody like me coming down and saying, I'm a professor at a major university and let me tell you what you need. You'll never get anywhere in life unless you do what I say, <laughs> because they've been told that before uh, in different words, but they've been told that before. Isn't this the future of uh, our democracy? It's the future of, uh, yes. The future of our democracy as a country. Right. The, the, the future of participatory democracy is, is tied up in this. And uh, we have a lot of people concerned about it. We, we don't have as many people as we should doing, doing something about it, is, is, is my impression. Uh, I, uh, and you see, people who are in major research universities uh, have a vested interest in th things as they are. Um, 
mean, most of us would like to feel that we're part of change. There are things that we do um, in this department, service learning, where we send our students out to work with, uh, with, with kids, um, uh, where we, uh, departments like theater, which uh, will send faculty members and graduate students out to work with uh, children in poor areas uh, to where learning becomes a part of uh, drama, which they understand instinctively. Um, but it, it seems very hit or miss to me. Um, and I, I know there are um, lots of good people working on it. I've gone through your website. I've been really impressed. Uh, I don't think, I think you could probably interview every linguist in the United States, and you wouldn't have anyone say you need to have them diagramming sentences on the board, and spelling is the most important thing in the development of communication skills, and yet we, we don't seem to be going anywhere as fast as we need to be. I, I don't want to be pessimistic and say we're not, we're not making progress, and I think attitudes are changing, but Time's moving on. Yeah, that's the difficulty. There's a flat line, maybe a small incremental improvement, but there's a, the whole literacy thing's been flat line for a long time. Yes. We've been all these changes. Well, let's teach this way. Let's teach that way. Flat line it goes. But meantime, the, the society's accelerating in its demand for yeah, us. Absolutely. And therefore, there's more falling out than ever before. Yeah. Yeah, I wish you could have been here last week. We had a uh, grad student come in to take her ex well, it wasn't really an exam, but she was she was talking about the dissertation that she wants to write, and she's uh, completed everything but her dissertation in English, and she's now teaching uh, in the public school system in Houston, where most of her students are Spanish speakers, or e ESL, and to hear her talk about uh, the gap between the students that she teaches. And the kind of standardized testing that's being um, uh, implemented in, in the state of Texas uh, and the likelihood of the one meeting the expectations of the other is just appalling. Yeah, did you see that CNN th report it was two High weekends stakes. ago? High stakes testing? Uh, no. I, yeah, yeah, it was I've very read. much on the point. I mean, these, these tests have in, inside them very implicit uh, assumptions about uh, cultural and social relevance that are way off the mark and and you know sidelining even more and more people. Yes. As we come to a close here, I don't mean to cut you off. If you've got a question, I want you to get in with it. Um, I, I do have a question. Um, when we refer to the medieval chancery, and we just we say the chancery scribes or yeah, referring to. To someone who hasn't studied English, who hasn't really delved into this space, what do we mean? What are, what are we talking about? I'm looking for something that's kind of a basic to someone to understand. How many people? What what was this this tribe of of scribes, so to speak? How how many people are we talking about that were involved in the medieval chancery? Uh, the, well, the medieval chancery was. Uh, I, I noticed John said 220. Um, and that's, if you include all the various hangers-on and what we would call contract workers, that's probably right. Uh, I think they had probably more like a hundred people who were officially, a hundred, hundred and twenty people who were officially classified as chancery clerks. Um, the, the Royal Chancery was as close to the central administrative office of the royal government as uh, you would have as a modern equivalent. Um, the chancery was started off as um, the scriptorium or writing pool of the king. That is, it simply produced decrees, but it very quickly um, assumed uh, some judicial and legal functions. Um, so at the very top of the chancery, you have 12 clerks who um, oversaw the production of uh, things like uh, treaties, uh, very important documents, um, others like deeds that are maybe less, and underneath these 12 uh, were uh, a rather large number of people um, 
of intermediate status who um, at the very bottom did nothing but copying and writing. Uh, and others, as they move up, actually had some kind of discretion in what they did. And it's, it's these lower ranking people that I think were training um, law students and others. They in were the, the interface for radiation. Yeah, yeah, because they didn't have much money. And and I remember when John first brought this up he, he, you know, in the audit, auditory conversation, in the phone conversation, he talked about 26, and then it later went to, to 220 or something, as if there really was this central core and then these rings around them. Well, I think that's accurate. Uh, I, the question is how wide the rings go. And that book I worked on, uh, which is based on looking, essentially looking at people who signed off on documents and then other people who were, uh, who were named, say, in a law case as being a chancery clerk, um, I think I came up with about 120, but it, it could very well be uh, more. And this is also the chancery of Henry V, and Henry cut back. He was very efficient, and uh, they fired a lot of people. Uh, sort of the, uh, he made his chancellor the uh, Donald Trump of, uh, of the time. Uh, the chancery worked directly under the chancellor of England, which is why it's called the, 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 the chancery. Um, so it was... It was like the central administration. Now, there was also the exchequer, which dealt with the finances. Uh, so that's you know that's the equivalent of the of the uh, uh, central government. Um, suddenly, I've been talking so much, I've I run, a, run out of words. What do we do? Well, I have a sense that that, that that these scribes, because they were so close and because they spoke the language and they were the interface yeah. for so many things, that a lot of differentiation and governmental function would follow from them rather than exist before them, in a way. Well, it did, because uh, the exchequer had one main function, which was to deal with finances and taxes. Uh, because the chancery had the capability of evolving in some way, it became the court of chancery, a term that we still use. Um, the chancellor's court was a court in which if you couldn't find a remedy under the existing court systems, uh, and there were several, you could come to the chancery. And so it became very popular in the 14th and 15th century. So some of these chancery clerks were also functioning as attorneys um, in their own court. They were helping to write the documents that uh, would enable these cases to, to, to go forward. Um, and eventually, by the time you get to the 18th and 19th century, when you're talking about chancery, everyone thinks about the court of chancery. Uh, and the, the most most famous case is uh, Charles Dickens' novel Bleak House, in which the the chantry, which by that time was just a sinkhole, <laughs> okay, and so going, uh, you know, for, uh, in its inception, it was the place you wanted to go because there was some flexibility. The chancellor could say, "Well, okay, you know, we we're going to give you, we'll give you the benefit of the doubt, even though strictly speaking, the loss is this." Uh, where it was a very flexible case to be to where it became just a sinkhole of, of expenses and delays and uh, lawyers the feathering their own nests. Yeah. So that, that, that's a source, I think, of confusion when people hear the, 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 the chancery. But in the 15th century, uh, 14th and 15th century, the, the chancery court was still uh, a minor function or a lesser function of, of the chancery itself, which still mainly dealt with the administration. They kept the, the roles of parliament. For example, uh, they were the records office. Uh, they stored records in the Tower of London and in this uh, place in the middle of London. Um, and so if you, uh, if you wanted to find, a, if the king had granted you uh, your, your great-great-grandfather some land and there was a, a letter that said that, you would go to the chancery and pay them some money and they would go through their roles and they'd find that for you in in Latin yeah <laughs> that puts it in perspective because I think a lot of people teachers or, or and when we yeah. talk about the history and we talk about the chancery scribes we get a lot of blank kind of not really knowing yeah. what we're talking about so I appreciate you well it, it was a mixed group and I think I said at the beginning the upper rank of the chancery clerks the ones that John and I were first looking at 
were really pretty much removed from English. Um, uh, they were very well to do. Uh, they had all kinds of ways of making money, particularly through land speculation, because the the, the, the records of land transfers would come to them, <laughs> and uh, the 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 roles of the time were just filled with these land investments, where everybody's a chancery clerk, and they they you know they get hold of some land, and uh, then they for a fee they let it they let it go later. Um, there was so, no SEC watching over insider knowledge. <laughs> certainly not. They were certainly not. I mean, that's why you wanted the job because it was insider trading. I mean, that was that was just a given of uh, of. Uh, medieval, any kind of medieval uh, government, uh, very much like um, the state of Louisiana uh, <laughs> until recently. <laughs> until recently. Okay. The, okay. Well, that, that, that part will read well to some later on. It. <laughs> yes. <laughs> <laughs> A final question. I know I appreciate you staying as long with us as you mm -hmm. have. Um, one of the things that really attracted me to uh, your webpage when I first read it was this phrase, the textual awakening of the middle class. Yes. It, it, which that kind of kicks back into our whole theme in a way, which was that, I mean, reading changes who we are. Yes. Writing changes who we are. When we engage in this, even one of we could say, well, un until there's a certain need, there's no, you know, <laughs> we don't engage in it. But once we do engage in it, it creates need. And the need wants us to engage yeah. more. And the more we engage in there's more need. And it just right. ratchets itself. Right. Uh, <laughs> but yeah. boom. It's well, you see, world. you see what happened to the English central government, which is that they start off with just a few records and then it snowballs. And what I'm looking at is how that happens to the rest of us. Uh, you know, by textual making, it's time to realize that's a kind of dramatic, catchy title. But I'm really writing about how middle class citizens, especially in London, uh, acquired writing practices, personal writing practices. Um, and so the, there's a transference of this dependence on writing from these clerical and legal classes to ordinary people, what we would call ordinary middle class people. And, and that happened in, in the 15th century. Uh, that was the beginning of it. And now we're enmeshed in it. <laughs> we We've just paid our taxes. We know exactly how bad it can get uh, going through these records. So we've all become 13th century chancery clerks in a way. <laughs> yeah, or, or, or our, our series title, Children of the Code. Children of the Code. We have all become children of the code in, in, in some way or another. So I'm looking at how this all began, when, when these uh, merchants and in some cases, their wives started saying, "I can do that too. Let's let's see how it would be if I sent a letter to my cousin asking for a couple of bottles of wine." Um, and there are plenty of letters uh, that have no historical interest in in the National Archives of Britain, where um, I've got one next door, a copy of one where. This uh, student is writing and saying, uh, "Will you send me some cheeses, Mom?" And uh, uh, there, and of course, there are lots of student letters because they're always writing home, just like they are now. By the way, I need some money, or they're writing to their future employee. Have you looked into that job for me uh, yet? So, it's beginning to gel that this is a skill that they need to uh, to get along in life. So that's what I mean by textual awakening, just the sense that I can do this too. And it's snowballing effect. That, 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 that just a few do it, and more and more do it, and, and more and more do it, and then we get, like you said, we're doing our tax returns. Yes, yes, or dealing with uh, HMOs. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Even worse. <laughs> Your Excellent. money or your life. Is there something we didn't talk about that you think's vital, given your sense of what we're about? No, I think I, I think I probably lectured too much. So no, 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 I you're apologize. great. And we, we 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 cut the clips and we, she's going. We're making little marks and yeah. and uh, and uh, it, it's been great. I appreciate your perspective on this. I mean, yeah. the, um, this is one of the things that's really missing out there. Is, is a sense that 
It hasn't always been like this. This is this this developed, yeah, and it developed in ways that there wasn't any cognitive scientists and developmental psychologists or modern code scientists or or English right. professors all sitting around saying, "Let's do this right." Given what's at stake, yeah, state. let's let's clear the boards here and go back and see what really works and and how people can move into this world, which is not going to go away. I mean, we're still going to have our T H R O U G H T. That's I. I just don't think there's any hope for simplified spelling. Um, uh, let Let's see how we can get people into this in a, in, a, in a way that actually works, instead of trying to uh, teach them a system that that you know may have worked with ten percent of the population in 1735, but it's just it's just not going to cut it with the population that we've got now. And and you know, you've got a wonderful list of people who, who've probably got suggestions. If uh, uh, we ought to, it, you know, anybody who who's behind the No Child Left Behind bill probably needs to uh, look at this, but, but probably won't. <laughs> they just... Uh, <laughs> our, our basic theme is, is, is um, we got to catch the ball before we throw it. Yeah, yeah. And, and we have been trying to throw this thing in every different which way, but we haven't taken the time yeah. to really understand what we're talking about as a society. No. And that's what we're trying to inspire and catalyze. Well, you're really talking about a, a root and branch approach. Um, and because I think the, uh, the current models, I mean, I, I think we have some good current models of teaching writing um, and maybe maybe we have several good models of of, of teaching writing, uh, but when you look at the magnitude of, of the problem and the fact that we're still grinding out teachers who have no more concept of the social history of English uh, when they leave a university than when they they came in, um, you know that's that's a problem. Um, that is. Um, <laughs> I think most education co colleges require a course in in English linguistics, which is good, but a lot of times it's taught from a very technical point of view. You talk about Grimm's Law and things like that. Well, these are the teachers who the next year are going to go off into these school districts where three-quarters of the students speak Spanish or, or Vietnamese is spoken at home in Louisiana or um, uh, some variety of black English and they're going to go in there and may very well think uh, that uh, that these are somehow debased forms of English, that, that black English is just uh, the, uh, a kind of uh, form of English spoken by uh, people who haven't thought about it very much, when in fact it's a very highly evolved form of English, and in some senses a more evolved uh, form of English than so-called standard English, because it's carried uh, language change uh, one step farther in many cases uh, than, than, than standard English. but. These teachers are not going to know that. They're, they're going to go in with maybe good intentions, but a wrong knowledge base. So time for a change. Yeah. Yeah. I have one last question as we wrap up here. Mm -hmm. You mentioned spelling reform attempts earlier. Um, just out of curiosity, being who you are and studying in this, what's, what's your favorite um, spelling reform attempt story? Did you share that with us? Or oh, gosh. Is there one that's really tickled you or that you got a real kick out of? Well, uh, frankly, no, because they all uh, uh, fail so badly. Uh, I think George Bernard Shaw um, uh, at attempts are amusing, uh, but that's because uh, I think Shaw was... Uh, uh, so full of himself that uh, he actually thought he thought he was such an important figure uh, that he could actually implement a change on his own just by being uh, GBS. Um, uh, there are lots of good attempts like that, uh, good-hearted attempts like that in the 19th century. I mean, Shaw was coming out of a tradition. Uh, there was another guy, um, F.J. Furnival, who was one of these... Uh, um, 
Victorian busybodies, uh, most of us in English know him because he edited in very badly uh, many, many editions of Middle English uh, uh, text, and he wrote all of his introductions in something like the kind of uh, spelling reform that um, uh, Shaw advocated. I think Shaw came out of that kind of Fabian socialist tr tr tradition, and they really look quaint. I think nowadays, and uh, one of the problems is that uh, you know if you if you try to reform spelling to make it English spelling to make it sound like it's pronounced, well, who's doing the pronouncing? So they may very well that uh, look like what Shaw and Furnival pronounce, but it sure doesn't look like the way they talk over here in Thibodeau. Um, and that's uh, that. That's a problem with with uh, spelling reform. Is that you've got to decide on how things are actually pronounced. And of course, we 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 in the British have a, a, a different <laughs> a different approach to that. Uh, anyway, that's I, I you know. I, yeah. Thank you. Just that. yeah. We'll talk a couple minutes before it left. We'll shut the lights down. Thank you so much.